If you looked at Canadian citizens, what group of people has the highest rate of obesity and diabetes? If you said Native, Native Canadians, First Nations, you'd be right. It's got to be genetic, right? Because they have a higher preponderance of those things than any other group. Isn't that right? But what's interesting is 200 years ago in Victoria, how many were obese? None. How many had diabetes? Heart disease? You know, they did a study of the Inuit in, uh, in Greenland, and they looked at basically, I forget what it was, I think it was about 2,000 of them. And they looked and they found that there was, no, there was no issues. There was no heart disease, there was no blood pressure issues, there was nothing. And you know, it's funny, because what do Inuit eat? Blubber breakfast, blubber snack, blubber lunch, blubber snack, blubber dinner, blubber midnight snack, because it doesn't get dark, especially, you know, they just keep eating 24 hours. Blubber, 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 blubber. And they have what? And if they don't have blubber, what do they have? Meat. Meat, blubber, meat, blubber, meat, meat, blubber, blubber. <laughs> no heart disease. The moment they adopt the Western diet, the high carb diet, you got to get these whole grains into you and you got to get this dairy into you, what happens to them? We could look at the Maasai people in Nairobi in Africa as they're going around basically cutting open that buffalo and sucking his blood out, you know, beating stuff over the head and eating it, right? They go into this, they have no cancers. No, of the rate of heart disease and cancer and diabetes in this group of people is like almost nil. As soon as they move into Nairobi, what happens? Within a half a decade, they've completely changed their physiology. I call it the whitey plague. Because, you know, what, if you think about it, before whitey showed up here, what, what were their biggest issues? Well, trauma, right? You could die from trauma. If we look at hunter-gatherers or our, our Paleolithic ancestors, if you look at them, what did they die of? What was their average lifespan? About 42. And what's our average lifespan? 70. My God, the modern diet and the modern medicine must be, you know, just adding years to our life. Eh, not at all. I'll explain in a minute. But what, the average lifespan was about 42. But what did they die of is the big question. What did they die of? They died of trauma or starvation. Right? Hunting a mammoth with a stick is it's risky. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so they die. And if you fall and break your leg and it gets infected, not great. Everybody get it? Hey, how many of you broke an arm or a limb or, you know, something stupid? Yeah, of course. So you're done. You're out. Probably didn't make it. More, more for us to eat. You know, that's okay. That's how it works out. So, but over 20, 20 to 25% of them lived into a, into a ripe old age, into their 70s and 80s and 90s. 25% of them. Now, the average lifespan was much lower. Why? Because if you're in famine, who dies first? The young. So how do you figure out average lifespan? Average lifespan is nothing more than average what? Age of death. So if half this room lives to 100, and half this room lives to two, what's the average lifespan? It's 51, but you, some people are, <laughs> right? Dan's got a calculator, <laughs> but it's 51. But isn't that interesting, but half the room lived to 100, 100 years old, or whatever, 102, whatever I said. So I'll tell you that, that the, clearly based on the literature, the, the, the biggest impact on lifespan isn't to add years on to a 70-year-old. Because if you added three years to everybody's life, you know, when they got to everybody who reached 50, if you could add three years to everybody's life, you would only add three years of lifespan. But if you can stop a two-year-old from dying and they live to 70, you added 68 years. Now, statistically, the power of that in, ch in shifting that average age of, or that average lifespan is huge, isn't it? So the biggest changes in our lifespan haven't come from allowing our elderly to live longer. They've come from what? Stopping our youth from dying, which really skews the average age of death, doesn't it? And by the way, when you're a 70-year-old living here two or 300 years ago, were you hanging around with a tube up your bottom and tubes up here and you couldn't work and you, know, you couldn't participate in the community and you had no teeth and you were obese and was that the issue? full of cancer and diabetes and everything? Was that the issue? No chance. So they were, they were doing okay, and then what happened? Whitey. Whitey showed up with what? White bread, white flour, white sugar, white dairy, a white dude in a white coat giving out white pills. And it's never been worse. It's gone downhill every year. So what's interesting if you understand family history, because a lot of people think family history means genetics. How many of you saw the movie Super Size Me? Did you see that movie? Yeah. What was really interesting about that movie, other than the fact that 
you know, the guy vomited it on his first French fry. And then, I, I, you know, I, what I found most interesting, these are the two things I think are take home points from that, that show. One is, if you eat Big Macs, you don't want to have sex. <laughs> Fellas alone, that's fine, <laughs> right? If you talk sex, guys will listen. But the other interesting thing was this, is that at the beginning when he ate McDonald's, he vomited. After, by, by, by about the 14th day, he had already gained weight, lost all his sex drive, was depressed. He only felt good during eating. In 14 days, he went from vomiting to only being able to feel good while he was consuming the food. He felt gross before and gross after, but he felt good when he ate it. So what did he want to do all the time? Eat the food, because it's the only time he did what? Felt good. And humans are genetically programmed to do what? Do anything we can to feel good. It's dopamine. Humans are ge the, the strongest drive in any human being is to feel good. It's to have dopamine released in our brain, in the ventral tegmental area of our brain. If we get that dopamine, we're happy. A lot, I used to believe that, that there was two things that drove human behavior. One was that we wanted to move away from things we didn't like, and the other one was that we wanted to move towards things we do like. I was wrong. Research is clear, we only want to move towards things we do like, and the things that we don't like are just simply things that don't give us enough dopamine. It's not that we want to get away from them, it's just that they don't offer us anything that we want. And for, and for humans, here's what's interesting about humans, we can't store pleasure. You can't store, you can store the effects of eating yourself for pleasure, can't you? But you can't store pleasure. So every day when you wake up, guess what? Your goal is to have pleasure. And what I'll tell you, here's the secret to life. I remember I got asked at a seminar once and someone said, you know, Dr. Chestnut, if you could just, you know, tell me one thing, one way you were going to determine whether somebody was going to be healthy or sick or what's the predictor, you know, what's the one question you could ask? And I say it's really easy. If you get dopamine from things that are genetically congruent and healthy for you, if that's where your source of dopamine is, you're going to be fine. If you get dopamine from things that aren't genetically congruent and things that are stressors in your life, you're gonna die early, and you're gonna have a shorter, more miserable life, 100%. That's it. Where you get your dopamine determines your quality and quantity of life. The, 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 the fairness is, is that you are genetically programmed to get dopamine from what? Healthy relationships, self-esteem, loving yourself, hanging out with a community of people that you, that you participate with. You know what, you're not supposed to get the same amount of dopamine from your accomplishments as you are your contributions. Did you know that? that genetically we're pack animals. And we require a pack to feel good. And we require the idea and the concept within ourselves that our contribution to that pack is important to the well-being and survival of that pack. And so it, our accomplishments are only meaningful if they mean something to a peer group or to a group of people that we care about. Do you understand? That dopamine is much stronger from a sense of contribution than it is from a sense of personal accomplishment. That's interesting. I got a lot of stuff to talk about. I know I'm all over the, all over the map here, but where was I before I digressed there? I'll, I think I was talking about the Great Lakes, wasn't I? <laughs> anyway. Um, so, let's talk a little bit about, about you know, what health is and what performance is, because you can't separate them. Because listen, all you are is an ecosystem of cells. That's what human beings are. You're about 75 trillion cells hanging out together in an ecosystem. Actually, what you are is animated Earth. That's what I teach. That there's nothing in you that isn't Earth. So you know, we live on a recycling depot. The Earth is a recycling depot. There's nothing. I mean, you literally drink dinosaur urine and eat dinosaur poop. And you eat the poop and the urine of your ancestors and you eat the flesh of your ancestors. And that's just how it goes, right? Really, I said, oh, I know where I was. I was on Super Size. But anyway, let's talk about the eating, the, eating our answer, you know, your, your grandfather's poop. But, um, so we live on a giant recycling depot. So anything that's in you is Earth. You're just animated Earth. So the intelligence, the genetic intelligence of your body takes a carrot and turns it into you. Isn't that amazing? And the genetic intelligence of that carrot takes the Earth and turns it into carrot. Isn't that incredible? That's it. So the intelligence that we have in our body, I mean, if you could write down what goes on in one cell in one second, you know, you would write your entire lifetime and, and never be finished. That's what goes on in one cell in one second. And you have 75 trillion cells all working together towards a, com a common goal. And you have, you know, your common goal is either going to be this. You ready? You only, have two, you, you only have two choices for the common goal of all your cells. Survival or growth and, and reproduction. 
Do you understand? Survival or growth and reproduction? If you're in survival mode, you're gonna have a worse, shorter life. If you're in growth and repair, you're gonna get the most you can out of this flash, this moment, flash moment in time that we call our lifespan.